<coughs> All right. We will speak again about the Pasha of the week, as we usually do on Tuesday. I'm assuming that you know it's Pasha of Ayero. And this is the second Pasha in the Torah that speaks exclusively about Avromovi. The first was Lech Lecha last week. The second one is Vayero this week. Again, I want to remind you if, you, if there are some words that you don't understand, you can, you can stop me. I'll try to explain it to you. Uh, because the objective of this, these talks is that people should understand them, not that it should sound nice. I mentioned to you last week that the Chumash Bereshis, the entire Chumash Bereshis is called in the Gemara Sefer HaYosher, the book of the righteous, and because it speaks about the Ovois, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yankiv, who are the righteous of the world. And as I mentioned to you yesterday, as we go through the Chumash, I want to make certain points <coughs> to bring out and to show where their righteousness manifests itself. Because the idea of Yosher does not only mean that they do the right thing and they don't, don't do the wrong thing. Yosher means that they go on a straight path. They're not political. They take things the way, the way they come, they trust, they trust in Hashem, they trust their own lives, and they go on the path that they have to go. But the consequences are, consequences, everybody knows, the result, what can happen is, from this, they don't, they doesn't stop them. They don't know what's going to happen. <coughs> they still do what they need to do. This means walking on the straight, on the straight line, and trusting in, in, in Hashem, and leading them in the right direction. So we pointed out last week. We pointed out certain things that we see from Abram's life, how he was an absolute trust and didn't question anything, no matter where he's being led, being led to Eretz Knan and then to Mitzrayim and then back. No questions, he's following through on what my way he's being led. Coming up into our passion, Pashas Vayero. So in every aspect of Rome's life, if we pay attention to it, we immediately see this quality. Avram Vayero, Rashi says, begins at the point where Avram was three days after his bris mila, which means that he was very weak and almost sick. An adult person having a, an operation like that without anesthetics <laughs> uh, was quite an experience. And um, he was very weak, even to the extent that it says that Hashem, Rashi says Hashem came to pay him a sick visit. Because he was sick, and it's a mitzvah to visit the sick, so Abraham, Hashem came to pay him that, that visit, so he was really sick. In that state of weakness and sickness, Abram had every excuse to close his restaurant, to close his tent, to close up shop in terms of, of, of entertaining guests, etc. 
saying, I'm not in a position to do that now. I'm exempt. I'm exempt. I am excused from doing it. I have a very good excuse. And the Torah tells us that in this weakened state, Avram still felt his obligation to do what he can in terms of of bringing guests into the house and Avram's purpose of bringing the guests into the house was both I had twofold one is in order to to show the world the goodness of Hashem in other words to do good things in the world and the other is that that then this was also a means a means this was also a method through which Avram spread the knowledge of Hashem I'm sure you all know this because the people after they ate Avram explained to them that the food that they ate this was Avram's chance to talk to them the food that he ate was food that Hashem made, and therefore he urged them to thank Hashem. And this was one of the methods that Avram used to expose the, the lowly people around whom that he lived um, to, to Hashem, to knowing of knowledge about Hashem. So Avram did not spare himself. He did not find look for excuses. He felt he is able to do this even though it's difficult. That's his job and that's what he goes out to do. So he sits at the, at the, at the entrance of his tent and it's extremely unusually hot. And he says, It's unusually hot. If it's unusually hot, Rashi says that this union that was unusually hot was not an accident. This was something that Hashem intentionally did in order to keep Avram inside, to spare him this work. Avram surely realized that this extreme heat is the Hashdoch is Hashem's doing. So Avram didn't turn to Hashem and say, hey, you're making it impossible for me to do my work? Here I'm sick, number one. And I'm sick because I did your mitzvah to, to be mild myself. And then you're making it so hot. Forget it, I'm going to do my own thing. That wasn't Avram's reaction. Avram continued in, in his in his thing. You're saying it wasn't it wasn't that the Abishar made it hot in order to make it more difficult for Avram. He made it hot to make it easier for him so that he wouldn't be troubled by gas or other things. That's right. Of course. Of course. In other words, the Abishar was kind of directing him not to do his mitzvahs. Rome said, I'm not accepting that. There's an interesting lesson that we see also from this episode with the Malochim also in line with this. You learn that these three people that came to visit Avram were actually Malochim. The Malochim, they appeared like human beings. And as they were approaching Avram, they saw that Avram was in great pain. And Avram was changing his bandages, he was really in pain. So they stopped. They didn't proceed going forward. They didn't dare go and approach him. What happened as a result? 
Avram got up and he ran towards them. Right? That's what Rashi says. He ran towards them. So here again, they stopped because they, they didn't want to disturb him. As a result of them stopping, what happened? They disturbed him even more. Because had they approached him, he could have been, remained sit, sitting in his seat. And they approached him. Now he had to get up and chase after them. Nevertheless, we see here that you do the right thing as it occurs to you. You don't go beyond and say, okay, this is, this is the right thing, um, but who knows what's going to be the consequence. You do the right thing as it comes, and you don't have to worry about the consequence in terms of doing good things and the right thing. In terms of the hour you jumped up? Yeah. No, in terms of the malachim stopping. They stopped because they didn't want to disturb him. And by them stopping, they actually caused him to be disturbed even more. But they showed him that they didn't want to disturb him. That was an important message. Well, no, I don't understand. Who didn't want to disturb who? The Malachim didn't want to disturb Abraham. Yeah, but who did the right thing? We're learning from the attitude of Abraham that he did the right thing even if he's not... Uh... No, we, 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 I'm sorry, I'm showing that here again we see the Malachim stopped. This is, this is from the Malachim's perspective. They stopped because this was the right message at this moment. Even if something other other can result from it. They have to show respect for Avram regardless of what, what he may do. Then we proceed further in this parsha. Um, at the end of this visit of the Malachim, it says that the Malachim, they got up to, to leave, and Avram followed them. He was accompanying them out. He was all over them. He was going with them out. So this principle of Malada, to, to accompany your guests out, is a special mitzvah. It's one of the mitzvahs of, of Akmos Asokhin, is to see your guests out. But here, at this point, Abram already knew that they were Malach. When he first brought them in, he thought they were human beings. Because they looked like human beings, he prepared them food. But by the time they were leaving, he knew that they were Malach. Because they made the promise to Sarah that she's going to have a child. They helped Abram to get better. So they knew, he knew that they were Malach. So Malachim, they don't need your accompaniment. They don't need you to accompany them. And yet Avram got up and he accompanied them. So Rashi says, what was the reason that he accompanied them? Kosovu Sheheim Orchim. He thought that they were guests. In other words, he already knew that they were not human beings. He didn't think that they were a notion that they were human beings. But, but nevertheless, since they came to him as guests, he has to treat them as guests, regardless of whether they need this service or not. Again, we see a straight thinking without, without making any extraneous calculations. Extraneous, outside. Then they come to the story of its day. Hashem says, 
I must tell Avraham what I intend to do in Zdoim. Because after all, like Rashi says, after all, this is the land that I promised to him. And therefore, and, and also, I made, I declared him to be the father of the whole world and so forth. I have to, I'm, I'm, I'm obligated to let him know what I'm going to do with his children. And then Hashem comes and tells Abraham, Sudoim has reached the, has filled their, their bucket, so to speak. They reached their end and they have to be destroyed. They're evil. They're evil beyond tolerance. So Abraham, he hears from Hashem, they're evil beyond tolerance. What should he say? should say, good, clean up the world. Instead, Avram stands up and with the greatest chutzpah, right, with audacity, he speaks to Hashem and he says, how can you do that? How can you do that? Maybe there are tzaddikim inside in Zdoi. They are evil, but maybe there are tzaddikim. And maybe these tzaddikim can eventually affect them and change them around. And he went a whole discussion, 50, 45, 40, 30, 20, 10, not letting go. So here again we see the special, the, the sense of responsibility that Avram felt even for the people of Zdoim. He didn't dismiss them, oh, they are evil people, let them go. He was given charge, so to speak, of the whole world. He has to ultimately teach and reform the whole world. And these people are also his charge, and he has to see to it if he can protect them regardless of how evil they are. And then, of course, uh, this is the part that um, you haven't reached yet, I'm just um, moving across further down, all the way to the end. The end of Pasha's Vallejo is the episode with the Akeda, where Avram took Yitzchok his only son, and Yitzhak is the son that was promised to him that this is going to be the building block for your nation. And he put him on the altar and ready to slaughter him, ready to shake him and make a court. There we see beyond, beyond all measure, all limits, to what extent of Rome follows Hashem's word with that question, even if it doesn't make any sense at all. Because, as Rashi explains later on, there were, there were so many contradictions in that, in that mitzvah, in that directive, beyond, beyond limit. Because Hashem promised him that Yitzhak is going to be your son. And Yitzhak is going to build your nation. And um, originally when Avram insisted he must have a son was because Avram wanted to establish, and establish means establish forever his principles that people should know about Hashem. And here Hashem tells him, go bring him up and I'll make a call. Anything I can help you with? Bring out a call. Complete out of whack, so to speak, completely disturbing his whole perspective on life. Besides that, bring a korban of Yitzchok, bring a korban of a, a human korban, which is completely contrary to the principles that Avram believed in, the principles of, 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 of Hashem. By Noyach, Avram, Hashem said, when Hashem permitted Noyach to eat meat, 
he said, however, a human life, I'm going to, to demand, if anybody hurts a human life, that I'm going to demand, they have to answer to me. Uh, they, um, I mean, they'll have to answer. Demand means um, process, passage. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, ask, you know, demand to uh, give an explanation and, and, and punish for this, right? This is Mamas, the principle of Avram Savaida, and all of a sudden. Hashem tells him to shech Yitzchok. What should have been, what could have been his reaction? In every respect, you could say, what? What are you talking about? What are you saying? Is that, is that you? <laughs> is that for real? All kinds of different things. Besides the contradictions and the promises and all that. None of that. He had a clear directive to do that. If that's what he needs to do, he doesn't have to. It doesn't have to make sense to him. He doesn't have to answer any questions. He has to do his thing. Why is it then he objected though when it when it came to Stam and Amara? That when it came when it came to just slaughtering the one son, so then he didn't ask any questions. So when it came to them and where he, he, he objected. When I said, okay, so this is another this is another test, so so okay, so if you want to destroy it, so I'm also assuming you could have said the same thing about you know what what did he bring to No 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 you missed it. No, no. Hashem definitely brings punishment. Whether it's a complete destruction of Slain Bahmaira or it is um, a, an individual punishment for an individual person. And ultimately, you know, there is the, the, the long-standing punishment that because of Eitz Adas, every person that's born is due to die. That's also a punishment. There's no question of that. Here is a different thing. A human being to slaughter another human being, as a carbon oiler, hmm. that's completely contrary to all principles of Torah. Said he wanted Yitzhak or Sanhedrin? Zion? The Avon wanted the Sanhedrin to establish what? To establish his principles in the world. The principles of Avanda Sashem, of Emunah Sashem, of service of Hashem. Right. Zion? If Hashem already told Abraham that he is going to have his son, even if he is Yashiros and he is completely given over and he doesn't think twice, how could he not know? What, what, he, could, he couldn't think that God changed his mind. God cannot change his mind. God is God. God makes you know a something? promise. God follow it. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the trick over here was that Avram didn't even stop to think. He knew if he knew close quality, this is clearly what Hashem tells him to do. He didn't stop to make sense of it. Because if he would stop, it would be uh, impossible. Doesn't make any sense. Whichever way you approach it. As a matter of fact, I just want to add this. One of the things that are, that are explained, where do we see in the case of the Akedah, the Akedah means when, when Abraham was told to bring Yitzhak to Sakorbu, where do we see the special greatness of Abraham? As a matter of fact, I mean, he asked the question, the altar asked the question. You know, this is a sacrifice, this is a Mesir Nefesh, but many Jewish people went to Messina Snapchat throughout the ages. Why was this? Where, was the, where do we see especially the greatest of all? Yash came before This, there's many points, but there's one, one very central, very sharp point. And that is that when Abram hears from Moshe, take Yitzchok and shake him for a Korbu. He should have, he could have doubted, if he had any in iota of doubt, in terms of, of Emunas Hashem and Nebua, he could have doubted, is Hashem speaking to me? Is this real? Maybe it's an imagination. The whole Nebua imagination. The clarity 
of the fact that, that his Nebuah was to him a perfect clarity. He had no doubt that Hashem is telling him to do this. And this is why he was able to go ahead and do it. This itself shows Abraham's greatness. And he was able to have a Nebuah in such degree of clarity that even if the Nebuah didn't make any sense at all, he knows that it's not a Nebuah. Okay, so much for this principle which I said as we go to the Chumash to the Chumash Breishis we know that the Chumash Breishis is almost completely exclusively of um, um, stories the occurrences from now always of Rome, Yitzhak, Yanke and their children it's a storybook it's not a storybook it's the greatest source of lesson. It's the, it's the basis of the Jewish way of thought, of thinking. The straight, unconvoluted, unconvoluted means not confused, not, not uh, mixed up, straight thinking. And we do ours and Hashem will do His. Because Hashem. And this comes out of the of the Chumash Breshis throughout the entire process and we are going to try and bring it out as we go as we go along. Specifically in this part of Ayero there's a Sikh of Mreb Generally speaking, whatever we speak here is is one sikh or another, but just uh, uh, talking about Pashas Vayera. <coughs> and um, the Rebbe asks in this sikh the question, why was it that Hashem did not come to visit Avram to pay him a sick visit till the third day. Avram was he was sick. He was sick for three days. Why did he wait? Hashem waited for three days to visit him. Why not visit him on the first day? Why not visit him on the second day? Visiting the sick is one of the great principles of Torah, of Yiddishkeit. And Hashem is the one who demonstrates to us what are the principles of Yiddishkeit. Because what Hashem does, that's what we do. Um, so the Rebbe explains that the principle behind this is this. Um, it says that visiting the sick besides that it gives a person encouragement and gives him moral strength that you show him concern for him and so forth visiting the sick simply helps him <coughs> with a cure it helps him to get cured because when you visit the sick it says that you take away one sixtieth of his sickness. That's what it says. So surely, if Hashem would come and visit Abraham, surely he would, he would bring him, he would ease his pain and would bring him cure. So what's wrong with that? That would be a wonderful thing. Why leave Abraham suffer from his pain for three days? The explanation to that is there are certain principles involved in Torah and Mitzvahs. Hashem gave us Mitzvahs. 
Mila, the Mila, the Miss Mila was the first mitzvah that Abraham received that we received from Hashem directly. Later on, we by Matan Torah we received 613 mitzvahs. The principle of these mitzvahs that we received in Matan Torah <clears throat> what is the purpose of those mitzvahs? And we discussed it many times in the past that in fact Avram, Yitzhak, and Yankiv already did mitzvahs before Matan Torah that everybody knows that before Matan Torah Avram and Yitzhak were fulfilled the mitzvahs and yet there is a, a great and an important difference between the mitzvahs that they did before Matan Torah and the mitzvahs that, that we do after Matan Torah. And the, the, the principal difference is that before Matan Torah they did the mitzvahs because their intellect, they understood that this is what you have to do. This is based, so to speak, on their profound insight and understanding what is right and what is wrong and what Hashem wants, wants we should do. But there was no direct command, there was no direct instruction from Hashem to do it. The mitzvahs that we have after Matan Torah are mitzvahs that come directly from Hashem. So that when we do a mitzvah, it is not a mitzvah that the human being does because he understands he should do it. When we do a mitzvah, it's as if Hashem himself is doing it. Because we are doing what Hashem tells us to do. It's a completely different, different uh, significance. We, like we spoke last week, we do what Hashem does, tells us to do. And what's so beyond that? Yes, we do what Hashem tells us to do. But there is a resultant effect. There is a, there is a as a result of the fact that this is a mitzvah from Hashem, it has also a different effect, a different result than the mitzvah that they always did, the Avram Mitzvah did before they were commanded. In general, Um, you know that that the, 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 the ultimate the ultimate um, task that we all have task huh? you know what a task is a job the ultimate task that we all have the Jewish people have is to transform, to purify the world, to get rid of the clipper and bring out the Gdusha in the world, bring out the godliness in the world. How did Klippa get involved in the first place in the world? This started from the Chet Oiz Hadas. All the Mauritian, when he ate from this Eiz Hadas, this is what brought this confusion in the world where evil was mixed with good and, and, and everything got, got confused. Um, and our job throughout the ages is to, to clean it up, to bring out the godliness in the world and to eliminate the clip. And that we accomplish by doing mitzvahs for Hashem. Why Dafke? Why only Mitzvah Hashem? Because <clears throat> if a human being does something in the world, so he may be doing a good thing, but he does not have the power to change the actual Mitzvah, the actual world. In order to change something in the world, you have to have a godly power. 
And this is the power that we received at Matan Torah. A godly power that, uh, that we can actually engage and do things in the physical world and change that and to make the world physical world uh, kedush, make it whole. Before Matan Torah, that was not possible. This is why we see that, for instance, a Siddur, a Chumash, or a Sefer Teira, even though this is human, we wrote it down, a human being wrote it, a human being wrote the Sefer Teira, and then the Sefer Teira becomes holy. And it becomes very holy. How can a human being make something so holy? That's because he's doing a mitzvah from Hashem. Doing a mitzvah, so then this the, the, the has the power to actually change the, 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 the actual physical parchment. The parchment, you know what the parchment is? The piece of paper that the cemetery is written on becomes holy. That's because of the power of the mitzvah. This is ultimately the, the, the union of mitzvahs. Now, <clears throat> because that the mitzvah must, the purpose of the mitzvah is to actually affect the physical world, this is, this is why a mitzvah also is required to be done entirely within a natural physical context. And what context is? In a way. In other words, to do a mitzvah using miracles is not, a, is not accomplishing anything. Because it's not, it's not using the world to do it. You have to do a mitzvah properly and to accomplish it, you have to, it has to, the mitzvah has to be done within the limits of the natural world. For this, there is a famous story, you may have heard the story, the story from the Altman Rebbe, that the Alter Rebbe, when he was imprisoned, and uh, he was imprisoned, he, he, he was in a prison cell when he was in prison, and he would be taken from the prison cell to the court where he would be interrogated. You know what interrogated means? He would be questioned. He had to explain himself. The Alter Rebbe's imprisonment was due to the fact that he was accused that he wrote things against the king. So they asked him all kinds of questions, what he wrote in Tanya and so forth. And this went on for a long time. So they used to move the Alter Rebbe from his prison cell to the court. There was a waterway there. And they used to move him through the water on a boat. From the prison cell to the court. One time, as they were traveling on this water, the Alter Rebbe noticed that there was a moon, a, moon, a Levona, and he wasn't Mekadosh the Levona yet. He wanted to be Mekadosh the Levona, so he asked the driver to stop the boat so that he can be Mekadosh the Levona. The driver, the Goy, refused. The Alter Rebbe asked him again, he should stop the boat. And, they, and he refused. So when that happened, the, alter, the, the boat stopped. By itself. The boat stopped. And it wouldn't move. As much as he tried to move it, he couldn't understand what happened over there. It just wouldn't move. Then after a while, the boat started moving again. At that point, the Alter Rebbe asked him again, please stop the boat so I can even cut the boat. And then the guy realized that he better stop the boat because if he won't stop, the boat will stop by itself. So he stopped the boat, and let the Alter Rebbe do his thing, the college of the and then he went on his way. So the, so the question is, if the Alter Rebbe was able to stop, to have the boat stopped, Without the consent, without the agreement of the Goy, why did he need the Goy to agree with him? He could have stopped it and do, do, and, and do his thing. 
The answer is, it's a very important principle, the answer is that says that mitzvahs, the Kiddush Lavon is a mitzvah. A mitzvah has to be done entirely within the natural worldly context. Not using any miracles to be able to do the mitzvah. To stop the boat by miracle is taken away from the from the mitzvah. The Alter Rebbe wanted to do the mitzvah entirely on the natural level in order to have the most deepest effect on the world. That's why he wanted him, he wanted the, the boat stopped by the goy, so that the goy realizes that Ayid has to do a mitzvah. He has the power. He has to stop the boat in order to let Ayid do a mitzvah. That has a very deep effect on the whole world. Okay, so this is a, a principle, an important principle in our mitzvahs that we do, that all mitzvahs have to be done in, in, in entirely in a natural way. Now, coming back to Avraham, Avraham Bris Mila. The Bris Mila was actually the only mitzvah that Avraham received directly from Hashem. This mitzvah that Avram had, besides being the only mitzvah, but this mitzvah also made it possible, it gave the koyach to us, to his, to his offspring, to be able to do the mitzvahs that they will receive later on in modern time. In other words, everything that we have we, 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 we had Matan Torah, we had the Mitzrayim and all that, but the, the original Koyach, the original ability to do all of that, came to us from our always from Avram Yitzhak Yankim. So the Avram Yitzhak, Avram Yitzhak Yankim, they had to provide for us this ability to do mitzvahs. All the mitzvahs that they did, that were not commanded, that would not help us. Because we have to do mitzvahs in a different way. There was one mitzvah, the mitzvah of Bismillah. This mitzvah of Bismillah was similar to the mitzvahs that we will get <coughs> by Matan Torah. And therefore, this mitzvah was this one mitzvah that would give us the koyach to do our mitzvahs later on. This is why the Bismillah had to be done entirely within the natural limits. What's a natural limit? If a person goes through a miller at his age, he gets sick and he has pain. If Hashem would come and he would take away his sickness and he would take away his pain, then he's taking away from this effect of this mitzvah that is being done in a natural context. There will be a supernatural effect, power involved in this mitzvah. And therefore it will take away from the power and the value of the mitzvah. That's within a natural uh, context. Mm -hmm. Right. I just want to finish this thought and then we'll go. Okay? So this is the Rebbe's explanation, a phenomenal explanation. Hashem did not come to visit Avram the first two days because Hashem's coming to Avram would inevitably call, bring about a cure. Huh? Um, it, it means without question, for sure. And and um, and then it would it would take away from the from the effect from the fact that the mitzvah was done entirely in a natural uh, in a natural way. And the mitzvah had to be done in a natural way because it was necessary for all generations later that it should be done in a natural way. So that's why Hashem did not come to visit Avram the first day. Did not come to visit him on the second day, 
And the third day, he came to visit him. Why? Because the third day it says that that's the time when the Mila begins to heal anyway. This is the natural time for the Mila to heal. Isn't the third day the most painful day? Does it say about Shechem that they wait until the third day? Because it's the most... It's the most relative to the later days. But the earlier days, they are, they are, they are much weaker. There's a whole discussion about this. That actually the second day is more difficult than the third. And, um, and um, the third day, this is when it begins to cure, begins to heal. And that's why, this is one time that Hashem came to visit. What is this all? This is a nice sikha from Rebbe, which you can always look up and learn and tell us that. But the, the point which, uh, the, the, which, um, uh, which I want to bring out, bring, bring out here before we ask questions, is we have to understand, as we always make a point to discuss here, that all accomplishments, accomplishments, everything that we gain, everything that we, that we get from, from learning and doubling and so forth, there are two things. When a person learns Torah, there are two distinct mitzvahs, you know, two specific mitzvahs. There's a mitzvah to know Torah, but there is also a mitzvah to learn To know Torah is a mitzvah that everybody is very proud of. Oh, it's a nice thing to know and to, and, and to be able to converse and so forth. Learning Torah, this is where we have, um, we have a lot of difficulty because I have to give it time and I have to work hard and I have to exert myself and sometimes it becomes very hard to, <laughs> to understand it and to learn it. So, learning Torah, sometimes a person can sit and learn a whole hour, and he works very hard, and yet, he still didn't get to fully understand what he learned. So one would say, hey, I wasted my time. What did I do? I tried very hard, and I wasted my time. So we have to understand, this is not a time waste. This process, this initiative, this, this hard labor is really part of the mitzvah. And this is how we fulfill the mitzvah in this world. And this is how we ultimately purify ourselves and we purify the world. I mentioned to you a while ago that there was a child, and that's a soil going back many years, I'm helping me to estimate, maybe 40 years, um, 50 years ago. Because the story was, in that's a soil, there was a child who knew from birth the whole Torah. By heart. Did you ever hear this story? Mm-hmm. You heard the story, right? No. I think I, I must have told it over here. He, Mamish knew the whole Torah by heart. And um, the reason that happened, because it says, the mother says, that a child, right before he's born, a Malach teaches him the whole Torah. And then at birth, a Malach comes and gives him a little a little smack in the nose, and he forgets it. He forgets it. <coughs> but prior, and this learning in the womb is something that helps him later on when he starts learning Torah, it helps him because he already learned it before. And in this, in this child, the Malach didn't do his job. And the child was born, and he didn't forget. He remembered the whole Torah. I didn't see this child, but I personally 
spoke to someone who himself told me, I, I trust him, I wouldn't suspect that he would lie to me. He says he was standing in that soil on one of the streets, I don't remember which, which city, he was standing there and he was standing next to this kid. And he started saying, he started a Mishnah, and the kids started rattling off the rest of the mission. So this was a real occurrence. They didn't know about this until the, the child started going to Heder. He started going to Heder. He started teaching him Allah base. This is an Allah. He says, Allah base, giggle, dollar, hey, well, where did you get that from? And they start learning with him, Braishis, 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 Boro, Kim, in many cases, wherever you touch, he knows it. Okay? So you would think, hey, wonderful. Uh, right? Great. He knows it all. Tragic. Not wonderful. Tragic. Because that means that he will never have the process of learning. He will never go through the process of learning. He will never know what he knows. He will never mean anything to him. He didn't, he will not have gone through the labor and the fighting with his own mind, with his own heart to get to understand these, these things that he's learning. And, it's, and he, all his knowledge is totally worthless. Not only it's worthless, it's counterproductive. Because he can't concentrate, start to learn because he knows it. He can't learn what you already know. And yet, it, 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 what he knows is insignificant. In other words, he didn't have this, this challenge, this fight, and, and therefore his, and all this knowledge was insignificant. And the story is, as I remember it, that they took this little boy to the Belzer Rebbe, and the Belzer Rebbe gave him a bracha. Can you imagine that? He gave him a bracha that he should forget the Torah. Because the, the labor and the effort that we invest in learning, this is our greatest accomplishment. This is where we actually purify ourselves and purify our world. Because as the Zoya says, the difficulty that we have today in understanding Torah is not because we have stupid minds. Nobody here is stupid. We have good minds. But because the the coarseness the 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 the, the coarseness of the world the physicality of the world is so effective on us that we cannot understand a spiritual concept it conceals it may it, it there is like a wall between us and the time we're learning it but it doesn't make sense because this is uh, spiritual and godly and this and we our minds are in the physical world and we can connect we can connect this is the difficulty so therefore every time that we make a special effort and we break through and we finally understand what we learn that is really a fundamental and very great accomplishment Accomplishment in the world and accomplishment in ourselves. Every time that we have a breakthrough and we understand something in Torah, we have then made a little dent. You know what a dent is? A little, a little uh, scratch, a little refinement in our own brain, a little refinement in our own heart. And as a result, the next time it becomes a different thing, it becomes easier. And as time goes on, easier and easier. Not because we already learned, but because we become more refined. And we can relate to Torah much better. There's a similar story 
on the, on the, on the lighter, on the, on, on the richer uh, light. The story is that that's a machzedek. You heard of the Rebbe Tzemach Tzedek. Tzemach Tzedek was the third Rebbe from the Alton Rebbe, the Alton Rebbe, the Mito Rebbe, the Tzemach Tzedek. Tzemach Tzedek, he's a Rebbe, and all the Rebbes, we can't judge Rebbes. But one thing that was obvious in Tzemach Tzedek, Tzemach Tzedek was also, besides being a Rebbe, he was a tremendous goel. He was a tremendous lamb. He was a goel. The whole world used to correspond with him in Halach. Normally, the, the, the greatness of our Rabbeim, what we know is in Chesidus. They also were great Geinim in, in, in Nigling, but generally there is very little. From, from Mittel Reb there is a little bit, from Alten Reb there is a Shechonora. Very little in Nigla from the Rabbeim. But to Machzedek there is volumes and volumes and volumes in Nigla. In Gemara, in the Charles of Chuvus, and Tzemachzedek. So someone came into Tzemachzedek, a um, uh, Chosit, and he said to Tzemachzedek, Rebbe, what should I do? I don't want to learn. What should I do? I don't want to learn. So Tzemachzedek said to him, No, and what should I do that I do want to learn? In other words, if you don't want to learn, good. So do you have a challenge? Go ahead and work. Work on yourself. You have something to do. But what should I do? I do want to learn. So how am I going to accomplish my, my uh, purpose? <clears throat> so, the, the, in conclusion, this is the point that I want to bring out this time as always to encourage everyone here, all of us that they should understand that to learn Torah to learn Torah is really a very big challenge because Torah and the physical world that we are oriented with are very different, very opposite and it's very difficult to to learn it, to understand it, very difficult to have a sense what is it about? Why is, what am I learning? What is it about? Why do I need to learn this? Why do I need to learn it? I've spoken the other day. Why do I need to learn it? What does it do for me? It's very difficult to, re- to realize it. because that we are oriented, we are involved in the physical world, in the physicality of the world. With Hashem's help and with our effort, we'll, we'll break through little bits here, little bit but there, and to get to, to, to re- realize and recognize what Torah is, and what Yiddishkeit is, and um, to to elevate and to purify ourselves, and also thereby to elevate and purify and fulfill our mission in life in the world, and ultimately, as you all over here know, that ultimately our ultimate goal is to bring Mashiach, and this is how we bring Mashiach. By scratching the world, the coarseness and the heaviness and the, and the the concealment of the world, little by little. So, if it's difficult, like the Tzemach said, if it's difficult, good. What should I do if I do one more? Right? So, Nebuchadnezzar will help everyone here to have see success and, 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 uh, and growth and happiness from their own success. There's what I just want an interesting thing that came to my mind. I remember this is many years, many, many years ago there was a contest 
there was a contest in, in the entire so in the United States or, or in New York, a contest on Shakespeare. I don't know if you know who Shakespeare is. Shakespeare is some English writer uh, who was considered one of the greatest English writers. There was a contest among students um, about say, you know, who knows more, who remembers, whatever it is the contest was. And the students in Yeshiva University did very well in that contest. And, and as a result of that, the Yeshiva University arranged all kinds of honors for these students who did well on that on, in, on those contests. We brought them, brought them a lot of honor, brought them a lot of recognition. So I remember personally the Rebbe spoke about this, and he said, "Can you imagine?" You make a huge fuss of a Jewish boy who did well on the contest on Shakespeare. He says, a little boy who learns a blood gemara, you know what blood gemara is? A page of gemara, is infinitely superior to that expert in Shakespeare. And nobody makes any fuss of that. Did you ever make a fuss? Oh, my kids, you know, they learn the blood gemara. Nothing. They learn Shakespeare or how to make a fuss. And I remember the pain with which the Rebbe spoke about it. Because indeed, the reality is that to learn a blood gemara is really much more difficult, much more challenging than to learn anything in the secular world uh, Shakespeare or mathematics. I mean, I remember students coming, you know, uh, graduate students here, yeah. right? They come, well, they, they did well in college, and here they really challenge it. So it's a real, it's much more difficult. And not because of the language constraint, not because of anything else, but because the concepts and to follow the, the, the trend of thought is just simply much more difficult. And I will take one more minute because it just comes to me just to illustrate the point. Uh, even though I didn't plan that Hila to bring this story, I want to bring you the story. So you will realize what you accomplish by, by with your labor, with your efforts. There is a, the story, the story is of the Bes Yosef. The Bes Yosef was the person, this great person who wrote the Shulchan Aruch. The original Shulchan Aruch was written by the Bess Yosef. Bess Yosef, in addition that he had enormous, you know, genius with genius, but that's not his greatness. His greatness he was a tremendous masmid. He learned constantly. And the, his success in learning was due to his genius, but mostly because of his dedication. He was a tremendously diligent student. And that's why he was zeichet to bring to bring the Shekhan There's many stories about the Bessias. So one time it happened, Bessias was stuck on the Toysfus. You know what Toysfus is? Toysfus, in the Gemara, is, on the right is the Rashi, on the left is Toysfus. He was stuck on the Toysfus. He could not break through and understand the Swara of Taisus. And he labored on it for hours to get to understand what Taisus is saying. To make sense of this Taisus. Finally, he came to the Pshat. He realized what the Pshat is in the Taisus. Okay. And then, as a result of this, he came late to shul. There was a whole story about this, because he was so he couldn't he couldn't break away from this. But as he comes into this Medrash, he sees two young men sitting and learning Gemara. 
He walks over to see what they're learning. They're learning that same page what he just now labored on. And he listens in. They're learning the toys was that he was just finishing laboring them. So he was curious to see how they're going to go through the spaces, whether they're going to be sensitive to the difficulty and how they're going to explain it. They're learning the Tosos and without, completely seamlessly, without any difficulty, they learn the Tosos and right away they explain the sweat of the Tosos just like the Bish Yosef, the conclusion that Bish Yosef came to after hours of, of hard labor. So he heard all of this. He was taken aback. You can imagine what's happened over here. To me, this came so hard, and to them, this is a simple, a simple thing. So he went to the Ariza. The Ari was was the was the Chassid Sharov. The Ari in this town, Ari was the Makubal, was the, the, the and the, and this Yosef was the Rov. So he went to the Arizal and he told him what happened. And he asked him for an explanation. So the Arizal explained to him the following. He says that on everything in Torah there is a concealment. The clippers that conceal this, this union in Torah. And it, this is where the difficulty of learning comes from. Otherwise, everything will be open and will be obvious. The difficulty is at the moment when you have to break through this clip. After somebody breaks through it, then it becomes smooth sail for somebody else. Then it becomes obvious and easy to, to, to get by somebody else. Which means the original one, the one who has to break through it, for him, this is the this requires a lot of work. But to everybody else that follows, it's a smooth sail. So Marizal explained to the Yosef, you labored on this thesis, which means that you brought brought into this world this explanation and this concept. Once you brought it into the world, then for everybody else it becomes easy. So you have to understand, if something is difficult, there is accomplishment involved. This is not just difficulty because I don't have a good head. Nothing to do with that. It's a difficulty which you have to break through and then you have an accomplishment and it's your merit to accomplish it. And therefore the Rebbe will help each, everyone here to be successful and to grow in Torah and Mitzvahs and Yerushalayim and in happiness and all good things. What Abraham Amenu? We say that we are speaking to the priest not because of Abraham but because of Matilda. So if the priest of Abraham was already at such a high level, why would he do it because of Abraham? The priest of Abraham was on a very high level and Matilda was even higher. Ah, in comparison to his other mates, it was high, but not think as high as one expected. Why did it have to be said? It needs to be natural. Because the whole purpose of mitzvahs is to affect the natural world. <laughs> and so I am learning and knowing these two mitzvahs that go um, interrelated, or one does not affect the other. For example, I break my hope and I don't understand it, but I learn. Is that the mix of learning no, no. as good as it is, or is it yes. even better the learning when you really know? No, no, no. The, the time that you learn, you learn. So learning is not enhanced by the knowing, the mix of learning. The mitzvah of learning is not hampered. I don't know what the mitzvah is. Not, it's not detracted, it's not, it's not lessened, it's not become less. Yeah. If you, didn't, if you didn't get to know. Mitzvah, let's say, in that sense. And for example, people that they know easily, but they don't really break themselves, so you have knowing, but not That's the real right. learning. That's right. Why is it so on Avon Vinod and Shir Tanefesh, the Aiden uh, question is not real, but then it's No, no, it's not, I didn't say Mishir Tanefesh, I mean greatness. Greatness? Do you say Mishir Tanefesh about something else?
No, no, I said Mesir Snefesh that, that, that many people later on even had been Mesir Snefesh throughout the ages. That's why I mentioned Mesir Snefesh. So it's not the Mesir Snefesh that makes Avram so great. And so. What was the, the connection in it? Because is the person who was doing natural means and our, our learning is also like, through natural means breaking through. Mm-hmm. Well, the Bismillah is just an example. The main thing is, we have been beyond the Bismillah. We have all the mitzvahs that we have to do through natural means, including learning faith. In order to affect the natural world. Sorry? In order to affect the natural world. Right. Okay.